The point is not for you to slavishly follow the rules of the exercise. The point is you're starting with a game plan. It's just like being a football team in a huddle. You, you're calling your play. And if it doesn't go the way you want it to, if you've got a good quarterback, you can scramble and save the play. That's kind of what's going on. So we're just starting with the game plan. Last weekend, the Crumbs played a two-night run at White River Brewing in Springfield, Missouri. And while we were there, I sat down with my friend Alicia Thomas, a great singer and fiddle player who currently plays with Whippoorwills and used to play in my favorite Springfield band, The Random Strangers. Um, I've still got my fingers crossed for a Random Strangers reunion, so let's make that happen, okay guys? So on many occasions, she's expressed uh, her frustration with learning to improvise. And I've told her several times to show up early on one of our gig days, and I'd be more than happy to sit down and work with her. Well, and finally we did. And graciously, she agreed to let me record our lesson. And so in the interest of full disclosure, Alicia and I have worked through these ideas before, but it was in the before time over a year ago. So realistically, we were starting from scratch. Now, normally when working with a guitarist, I would begin with blues, but because Alicia's frame of reference is more in tune with folk music, I figured we'd start out more from the bluegrass point of view. And by the way, I'll be adding some additional commentary here and there in the video. So here we go. So I'm sitting here with uh, a good friend, Alicia Thomas, fiddle player, plays the Random Strangers and Whippoorwills Woo! in Springfield, <laughs> Missouri. And uh, I'm gonna run Alicia through some of the pentatonic exercises that I dealt with in an earlier video, just so you can see what happens um, when we go through these exercises. So let's try something real easily. I'm just, or real easy. I'm gonna play a real simple chord progression. And I just would like you to start throwing out some real easy ideas with the G major pentatonic scale. And that's going to be G, A, B, D, and E. Real simple ideas. Notice that Alicia's first solo is, as I said in the video, really nice, and it is. There are simple ideas, yes, but sometimes you just can't improve upon simplicity. Okay. So step two is to now play as close to wall-to-wall -wall eighth notes as you can. So stay in motion. So one, two, one, two, three, four. Notice how Alicia began to develop thematically consistent lines in this example. In other words, she's beginning to establish some anchor or default licks, which she can return to at will if she needs to gather her thoughts for the next phrase. So next exercise is to, again, use the pentatonic scale, but you cannot start your phrases on a G. Any other note of the scale is good, but try to avoid starting on a G. So one, two, one, two, three, four. Now, Alicia didn't always 
avoid starting on a G, and that's okay. Notice, though, that having and concentrating on a new idea prompted her to play differently. She begins to execute runs in different directions. She also begins to play four-note groupings, and again, she begins to include decorative flourishes, grace notes, mordents, and gruppettos into her lines. So this time we're going to go with a rhythm of two quarter notes, four eighth notes, bum, 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 bum. Note choices will be up to Alicia, but uh, you can only play that rhythm. Okay. okay. One, two, one, two, three, four. When faced with an unchanging rhythmic sequence, Alicia does the only thing possible, really, and goes for melodic variation, which also includes some decorative flourishes. Remember, for this task, any rhythmic variation is acceptable. So this time what we're going to do is to avoid actually initiating a note on count one. Notes can hold over count one, but don't actually execute a note on any count one this time. One, two, one, two, three, four. Notice, notice that that made you play totally differently. It, it, it really affects the way you play your lines, and that's part of the reason for an exercise like that. Now, avoiding count one is hard. Notice that Alicia's way of dealing with this restriction was to intuitively formulate a rhythmic motive, which she uses for nearly every phrase she played. And this simply ensures that she will never hit count one. Essentially, she's reimagined task number four. So this time we're, gonna, we're going to put space into the solo by either holding out some long notes or uh, hitting a note and resting. And so feel free to give, give your lines a lot of space. Okay. One, two, one, two, three, four. Notice that all of a sudden your lines became a lot more lyrical that time. So that they weren't as fast and fancy, but they did definitely become more lyrical. So this time what we're going to do is have Alicia play basically any of the ideas we've already talked about and put them all into one solo. And I'm going to play this uh, longer than the other excerpts because I want her to have time to develop some ideas. Okay? So one, two, one, two, three, four. Notice that was a very well developed solo with all sorts of different elements. And this is the thing that we're going. And remember, each of these restrictive exercises is designed to condition a specific response. And then notice that when I removed all the previous limitations, Alicia began to play with a freedom that she very likely didn't feel when we started. I want you to do the same thing you just did, but play it with your eyes closed. 
it, I swear it makes all the difference in the world because what you're doing when you tune your eyes out, you're tuning your ears in, and you might actually really surprise yourself some of the things you're gonna play. So let's do the same thing, but eyes closed, throw everything at the wall and see what happens. One, two, one, two, three, four. Tell me what the biggest difference in your playing was that time. No. The the immediate thing that I that I noticed is that you played louder. You played so much louder than you did on all the other examples. The other thing is you played more fluidly and you started doing uh, started playing little flourishes in your lines and this is the point we want to get to and the idea is that if we do these exercises where we just have given tasks that force us to be able to manipulate that scale once you're comfortable with manipulating that's when you can start um, interpreting and that's exactly what happened let's try another. so this time what we're gonna do is play the exact same scale but we're gonna change the key in the rhythmic feel to a swing rhythm um, a long, short, long, short, long, short, bum, 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 bum. And this is going to be an E blues. Play the same types of lines, but the, the framing of, of, the, uh, of the chord progression and of the music is going to change the way you play a little. Let's we'll see what happens. One, two, one, two, three, four. catch any stray notes that, that weren't in the original scale? An F sharp? I think you might have hit an F sharp a couple times. Did you not? Did you not oh, hit, hit some B flats? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So if we add that B flat, scale, we're now playing G major blues scale, or the E minor pentatonic, or that, the E minor blues. And yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of flavor there. And as far as the lines you were playing, how, how did you play? Well, no, 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 let's rate how you played. Oh, oh. Oh no, it was, it was a 10, it was odd. Oh. No, you played, you played beautiful, beautiful lines. And what's crazy about this is this is the same scale that we played the bluegrass things with. And it's just the framing of the chords makes you play it differently. And you totally played with a completely different feel. And that was amazing. Let's do one more thing. Um, let's go ahead and just flat out uh, burn, burn one. Okay. Remember, you don't always have to play fast. So, but, but again, it's a framing thing that if we're playing with a certain type of rhythmic pattern and a certain type of propulsiveness, the way you're playing will change. So let's see what happens. So uh, let's do... Uh
That's great. Um, notice, in order to sound like you're playing fast, you don't have to... You don't have to stay in motion. You can... Just some well-placed little flourishes is sometimes all it takes. I guess we really weren't actually burning, but we were playing much quicker than in the earlier tasks. And I wish I would have kept this progression going for a bit to really let Alicia dig in and capture some hotter lines. However, notice that several times she went for some speed and almost nailed it to the wall. A few more attempts and she'd have worked out the kinks in her quicker runs pretty quickly. Anyway. Thanks for letting, letting me subject you to torture. Um, I hope everybody watching this video takes some encouragement from this, that learning how to solo can be intimidating, but you always start with very, very simple ideas, develop them, reframe them in reference to the other ideas, and then you come out soloing beautifully. Thank you, Elisa. <laughs> So after looking at all the raw footage for this video, I really think the biggest takeaway from sitting down and working ideas out with Alicia is that by the end of the lesson, she was an entirely different improviser than when we had started. So maybe try some of these ideas out in your own improvisational workouts and see if they make a difference in your playing. Now remember, please like, share, and subscribe if you're enjoying the channel's content and feel free to leave comments or any suggestions for topics you might like to see in future videos. My name's Dave Holland and thanks for watching String Em Up. Have fun, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.